Hello, viewers of Foolish Bailey. Welcome to episode one of Referencing Baseball. This is an interview show where I am interviewing a player based only on things I can see on their baseball reference page. And with me is my special guest. You know him from John Boy Media, Talking Baseball Podcast, Sequence with Trevor Plouffe. It's, as you may have guessed, Trevor Plouffe. Yes. And number one guest. Yeah, I didn't know that. Now I feel pretty honored because uh, I'm a fan of yours and you know mm -hmm. that. Uh, I'm excited to go over this. This is a, I like the concept here and uh, I am also a big fan of baseball reference. So it's a right up my alley. Absolutely. Now, when I say first episode, it may very well be only episode. So I don't want to get your hopes up too high there. <laughs> Most of my creative pursuits end in a one off. We'll put it that way. So here we are on Trevor Plouffe's baseball reference page. Just sort of as a primer, Trevor, like what would you say is your relationship with baseball reference? And has it sort of changed for you, you know, as you transitioned into retirement and now your numbers are more concrete? Was it something you would check, you know, throughout your career? Is it only something you really got into after you stopped playing? Never looked at this during my playing career whatsoever. We had our own stat sheets and all the stuff that you needed. But as I've gotten into the media game and I got to know all these players and you got to know historical players and current it, this is this is my go-to website i i'm more here than fan graphs i see yeah. now, i don't know does that say something about me i think it does no i i really don't think it does because you know i i split time between this and fan graphs and even baseball savant pretty yeah. evenly like for for reference i'm stat head is is basically what i'm on all the time because i think that's just such a powerful tool but fan graphs is really good if you want like a quick leaderboard for like the current season, for example, and sure. And then Savant, you know, for all the stat cast stuff. So I, I don't think it says much about you, but there's something about that layout on baseball reference, you know, there's something about it. It's just timeless. It is timeless. And I've gone to the homepage thousands of times. I've never seen my face on it. I even, I've even pleaded to baseball reference on Twitter. I believe like, can you just put my face up? Like, just make me happy. Like mm -hmm. for the five seconds I'm on your homepage, I'd like to see my face has not happened. Do you want to check to see who's on it today? Let's do it. Let's, let's do it. Let's see who's on today. But well, we've got a Minnesota twin. Francisco Liriano's on there. Yeah, there he is right there. I got let's see how many we can name. Cause I see Chase Utley and, yeah, Fran Utley. and Frankie. Yeah. Francisco Liriano. Who's this Minnesota twin? Hey, ah, he seems very familiar. Let's see. Eddie. That's Guarnado. not. That, that is not Eddie. I mean, I know Eddie very well. Wow. Let's see. That's, let's see him through the years. Is this maybe more familiar <laughs> to you? <laughs> is rounder. <laughs> it just keeps getting rounder. I just saw Eddie yeah. like two months ago at a golf tournament. That's funny. Yeah, I'm usually Love pretty that. good. Like I, I've gotten to the point where I can sometimes recognize the Negro Leaguers because they've been added into the mix now. This is yeah, yeah. This is George Scales. His nickname was I think Tubby, or something like that. But yeah, George Scales, he was, I think, on the, he might have been on the, like, the ballot earlier. You know what I mean? Like, okay, the committee. okay. He, he should be a Hall of Famer. Like, those are some numbers right there. All I right. have not gotten into that. And, like, I know a lot of the records have changed, and there's lots of things I need to dive into. I have not gotten there yet. But I, I'm, you'll be my guy, actually, my go-to guy for that, what I need to be looking at and, you know, where the biggest, like, inclusions are. Yeah, well, that's definitely a big goal of mine for the channel this year is just to do more Negro Leagues, like black baseball type stuff. All right, so let's get started here on your baseball reference page. Um, you know, third line on here, born in West Hills, California. You're uh, drafted out of Crispy Carmel High School <laughs> uh, in Encino, California. I think one thing that people like about you, Trev, is that you are an unabashed Southern Californian. Like, that's who you are. You know, you're working with all these, you know, New York media, East Coast elite, you know, fat cats. But at your core, <laughs> you're a Southern California guy. And so, you know what? It's such a hotbed of, you know, not just baseball talent, but athletic talent in general. When you were growing up in Southern California, you know, who are the guys that you were playing with and, and who are the guys maybe, you know, a few years older than you in your region that, you know, they got into affiliated ball and you kind of looked up to them. Like who are your guys growing up in Southern California? What's funny is that it all changes year by year. You know, if you go and you play youth baseball, you know, like there's when you're 10 and 11, there's the guys. And when you're 13, there's the guys. And then a lot of the times the guys that end up making it aren't 
you know, prominent in the, like the youth baseball scene. Uh, but for me, like growing up, like of the guys that made it pro, I mean, Delman Young was that him and I played together my entire childhood. Um, so, and he was always like the best player of his age group. He was a year ahead of me, but we were always together. Um, I think once I got into high school, uh, that's when you start to see like the talent, like concentrated a little bit more, uh, from our area. I mean, obviously, uh, a lot of people know about Harvard Westlake and kind of what they bring. And I was in the same league as them. So it's crispy Carmelite. Crispy Carmel. Gotcha. Crispy Carmel. Same yeah, thing. Sounds delicious. <laughs> uh, about 500 kids. And, you know, we, uh, we had a good baseball program there, uh, but we got to face off uh, against a lot of talented players uh, in my time. And then like, again, the guys I really looked up to growing up probably didn't even make it. Yeah. Like Andy Campanella is a guy. I think he ended up playing at Cal, but, and maybe a little bit in the minor leagues, but never made it. But that was like a guy who, when I was younger, I thought that's the God of baseball right there. Right. Shout out to Andy Campanella. Yeah. My brother is who I watched mostly too. He's four years older than me and was just a monster in youth baseball, like an absolute monster. He was physically bigger than everybody, but more, and also like athletically more gifted as well. Like he'd had both things and, um, Again, he's one of those guys, you know, he played, he played independent baseball, played in D1, was a pitcher, uh, but never made it to affiliated ball and uh, obviously never made it to the big league. So, yeah, it changes, man. Definitely. I mean, it, it's shocking how it's like the best athletes when they're 14 aren't always the best athletes when they're 19, for example, you know, and it's just it can change, man. When did, when would you say it changed for you? Like, when did you, you know, become like a prospect, you know, in your mind, as far as like you know, playing in the big leagues one day or playing, you know, getting drafted, for example? You know, I was always good, but I was always small. So that was kind of my issue. I was just was, I was really skinny. Um, you know, the height was okay. Uh, but so I was, you know, overmatched sometimes physically, you know, growing up. And then we lived really far from where we played baseball. So I always played up. Uh, for instance, if people know Little League Baseball, I was eight years old playing the majors with, you know, 12-year-olds. And if you if you have kids, you really understand the difference between an eight year old and a twelve year old. It's crazy. Um, so again, I was just smaller than everybody, but because I played with the bigger competition, I feel like that really helped me in the long run. And I think one specific moment that I started to realize, like that, I could be a professional, uh, was Delman Young was going to a perfect game event, and I believe I was a sophomore at the time, and he had a dropout. He couldn't do it. This was in Florida. And so he recommended to them to take me and I ended up filling in for him and I played, you know, up, I was younger again and just had like a really, really good tournament. This is all the nation's like, you know, best players. And I was like, dude, I'm like better than these guys. <laughs> like, Holy shit. You know, this is cool. Uh, like lastings millage was on that team. Wow. That was a blast from the That's past. a name drop right um, there. Yeah. Ryan Sweeney, I feel like was on that team, but I remember going in and being like, damn, like, I am really good. Like sweet. Yeah. Like you could hang, you know? Yeah. All right. And you play in your bubble. So you never know. And so you get out and start playing other places and really you feel like I always felt like, you know, California has some of the best baseball in the country. I mean, obviously it does. Uh, And that was kind of an eye opener. So you'd go out and you'd see teams from Florida or Texas and they're really good too. And like how you match up with them, it says a lot. Drafted first round. 20th overall in the 2004 MLB June amateur draft. Way to go. Yes. You know, coming into that day, what was your level of awareness as far as like where you would be taken and, you know, were you thinking, Oh, you know, is the goal here to be a first round pick or, you know, were you thinking about certain teams? What was, what was your mind like on draft day? Cause it was totally different back then than even now, you know, where it's, you know, it's televised at least, and you've got the MLB network and all that. But now it's, you know, in 2004, different game for sure. Different game. We, uh, you listen to an audio clip on your desktop computer. That's what it was. And then they would list it after the audio would come out and then you got the refresher page, whatever. So it was very like, you know, now that I look back at it, it's kind of silly, but um, that day, by that point, I knew that, I told every team I'm, I'm not signing unless I go in the first round. I was going to go to USC, had a full ride to go there. And I was excited to do that. Um, but I knew there was a chance because I had went out to Pittsburgh who had the 11th pick and they worked Neil Walker and I out 
together, just us two. So they're basically deciding between us. And I knew, you know, if a team is looking to pick me at 11, then there's a chance that I'm going to be picked further down the first round. Um, I had talks with other teams, but you know, at that point, you're just, you just, you don't know what's going on, bro. Like he had workouts for a, a bunch of teams and you talked to a bunch of people and you didn't know who really liked you. So the twins kind of came out of nowhere. I had done some stuff for them, but um, uh, they liked me enough and took me 20th, right? 20th overall. They had a bunch of first Correct. round picks that year and I was the first one of it. This stands out to me just looking here because you don't see it on every page. National team, USA yeah. pro. 16U. Tell me about your experiences playing for, you know, representing the United States uh, as a teenager. It's the best type of baseball there is. I mean, I didn't get to play in the playoffs or World Series. So for me, it's the best type of baseball there is. I'm sure those guys would say differently. Um, But you can see it when guys play in the WBC. Like that means a lot. Like it's, there's something about putting your country's name across your chest and it takes all personal like um, stats, like and willing to have the best stats out of the window. They're gone. It's like, all I care about is winning and that type of baseball. You don't, you don't really get that until you get into the playoffs. So like you don't really get that during the regular season. Guys want stats. Like we're trying to get paid here, you know? So that type of baseball is really cool, but I got to play 16 and under. We went to Venezuela. Nice. And the Marquis Mientos, Caracas, and we played through there. I think we got, I think we got second play. I think we lost to Cuba there. Um, but again, you know, that was one of the times where you play against international players, and you're like, I'm pretty good. That was another big boost for me. I did really well in that tournament. Felt good about myself. And then the pro one was really cool. That was non forty man guys. So I was like right on the cusp. Like my next year was a forty man year, and we went to Germany. We went to Italy. Um, that was awesome. We ended up winning that year. We beat Cuba in the finals. Um, I think it was like a qualifier for the world world cup or something like that. But, um, the experience for playing for team USA is like, for me, like top. Really? It's like, not mid. Mm-hmm. It's not mid. I as the kids it's say. Not yeah. mid. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not, I really it's not enjoy L, it. Yeah. And you're not capping when you say that. Oh my God. <laughs> no cap. No okay. cap. All right. Nicknames. Nicknames. You have listed here as a nickname Special T. I'm, I'm curious on this one because, first of all, you know, it's, it's kind of a common form of nickname to have special and then, you know, the first letter of your first name. So, you know, for example, it would make sense if your name started with a K, Special K, it's a serial. Special T. I mean, specialty is a word, but where, where does specialty come from, Trevor? What makes you so special? Now, this, this nickname goes back very far. Um, we, I grew up in an area called Castic Lake, California. It's very rural, um, north of, Cal- of Los Angeles. And I did two things growing up. I rode my bike. We built dirt jumps and went you know, street riding and all that stuff. And I played baseball. That's it. That's all I did. So this is from my biker experience we had a castic uh, bike crew we called us ourselves caf castic air force and we all had nicknames and special t i don't know exactly where it came from i didn't come up with it. it was like given to me by i believe my brother and another guy named mark my brother's nickname was hd web it's very non-suitable for work i don't want to go into that <laughs> and then uh mark was 808 so Special T came and then it was just kind of my thing. And then not many people call me that. My really close friends know and they'll call me that. But uh, that comes from players weekend. You know, they say, put whatever you want in your back jersey. And I'm like, you know what? That's, that's the roots right there. Right. I stick to the roots. Were there any other nicknames you were debating for your players weekend jersey? Didn't make the cut? Not really because I have such a silly last name anyway. Everyone just calls me Ploofy. Right. You know, yeah. so I could have done like the Y, but like, that's silly. Now it's coach Trev. I got a new nickname. That's true. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, I forgot about maybe that, in like yeah. Nostradamus at this point. Oof. Cole Tucker gave me coach Trev. I'm very proud of that. Yeah. I love Cole. That's pretty good. We're scrolling Oof. down here. What do you, do you have a, do you have a visceral reaction just to, cause it, you know, 
this this for you represents like <laughs> a decade of work, right? You know, of, yeah, of, of lived experiences, as the kids might say. And and yet guys like me, we we do this all the time. We come and we glance at it for like 30 seconds and then try to draw a conclusion. Like, how does that make you, go, you feel? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have such a, depending on the day, I either feel like, God, I should have been such a better baseball player. Or on the flip side, I'm like, fuck, I was so lucky to have the career that I had. Mm-hmm. I go back and forth all the time. I'm happy with it. I know I, I worked my ass off to have the career. But sometimes when I look at the numbers, I'm like, damn, like there are areas that were very clear that I needed improvement in. And then maybe they didn't happen. And I'm not going to say like we weren't analytically inclined uh, in Minnesota, but we were uh, not analytically inclined in Minnesota. Yeah. Well, I mean, most of your career as a full-time player came before the stat cast year even. So I think that alone, you know, just completely changed the way, you know, teams approach the game for sure. Um, you had the pitch tracking stuff, but I think stat cast was such a game changer and that comes around in 2015, which is really your, really your last year of like, you know, like full-time like starter Trev, you know? Well, I was um, a full-time starter in 2016, but I got hurt. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But that's, that's 2015 is your last full season. Or so we'll say, you mm-hmm. know, in the majors, but, um, you know, what's really stood out to me when I looked at this was, you know, in these seasons where you got at least 400 plate appearances, you're playing for the twins. I mean, you're, you're a 103 OPS plus guy. And, you know, I don't know what that means to you necessarily, but I'll tell you what it means to me. It means you're an above average hitter when you were playing, you know, as like a full-time player. So, you know, how did those, you know, some of those, you know, maybe new stats you've learned about, you know, since you retired, how do those sort of uh, inform the way you view your career now? It's not even like new stats that I would go back and, and look at. I think it's just my overall perception of how the front offices view you. Mm. Uh, I'm out there during my career just trying to battle, put up good at bats, all of like the cliches. I want to help the team win. I want to do this. When really, like if you want to stick around for a long time, A, be like an elite player and just like do your thing or B, like learn what front offices want. And like really my on-base percentage should have been higher and needed to be higher, uh, which obviously would have risen uh, or had my OPS rise along with it. I think the biggest thing for me is I could hit for some power, uh, but I think my slugging would have increased, obviously, uh, if I just would have gotten on base a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So I think going back, working on getting pitches in the zone um, probably would have helped me a lot. And I didn't ever really think about getting on base, getting on base, getting on base. It was like, I got to drive in runs. I'm in the middle of the order. I got to get this guy in. Or, you know, if this situation calls for it, I got to get the runner over, uh, all that type of stuff. So I think that would be the main thing I'd work on just really trying to get on base in, in any, in any way. Right. You know, I don't know. I like, I like some parts of my career. Some parts I don't like the 304 OBP. That one kind of hurts me. Well, at least it's above 300. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, look, yeah, I, mean, I mean, I think 103 OPS plus, you know, in this stretch, I mean, that's pretty impressive. Like you did it for like a really significant stretch of your career. You were an above average big league hitter and you weren't playing, you know, like DH first base left field. Like you're playing mostly third base at this time. So that's, that's a pretty big deal. I would be, I'd be pretty proud. Thank you. I, I tell people I was an, a slightly above average player. Now, does that re- really represent me over the my whole career? Maybe not, but when you when you do what you just did and right. cherry pick a few years, I believe <laughs> I believe it is true. I'm the king of cherry picking. That's all I do on my channel. So you know, this is this also, is nothing for me. Also, again, with like you know, just some information because I don't even want to call it analytics. I mean, what? Why do we have to have like a this term that's like it's almost derogatory in some circles? Like it's just information, people. Right. You know. Um defensively, I think is the easiest way to up your war, your overall war. Definitely. You can manipulate how they grade defense. And I can tell people how I've actually directed people to my guy, Mark Simon, who works for ESPN, who helped me. I made one simple change, Bailey. Um, I moved closer to the line at third base. I was about to guess that's what it was. That's it. Yeah. yeah. 
And I don't know if the front offices are going to tell you that. Maybe they do now, mm-hmm. but mine didn't. And I had reached out to a guy via Twitter and learned that. And my my metrics went up. So, you know, those are all things. Like, if I'm a player now, you kind of got to play the game a little bit, um, especially if you want to stick around. If that's how they're going to value you, and they're trying to, they're really trying to value you guys using war right now. They're trying to negotiate that into the CBA. I'm kind of I'm very, actually very scared of that. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's the one thing. If I could go back, really, I, there's a few things that are just kind of obvious uh, that would have you know made my numbers look a lot better. Yeah, the the outfielder equivalent of that would be just playing like really deep, for example, exactly. center fielder, because it's all about mitigating the damage of extra base hits. You know, that's it. That is it. That's the key to having good defensive metrics is taking away extra base hits or just not allowing them. I exactly. guess in your vicinity. All right. What do we want to move on to here? Well, you had a four war season. I mean, that's yes, pretty impressive. 2014. Did you four to five war? You know, it says five plus is around all star. So, I mean, uh, I don't imagine you were necessarily, you know, in the running that year, but you know, I was you, pretty good. I had a pretty good start that year. I yeah. Did. You, you know, you could have made an argument maybe as a, as an alternate, you know, that year, a hundred percent, a career look, year. What we were talking about before, look at, Look at the exactly, D war. Exactly, exactly. Let's go. You in can fact, tell, let's go down can, here if we can. Can you tell when I made the adjustment? <laughs> yeah. So you go from negative seven at third to plus eight from 2013 to 2014. Is that around you the time you're making that change? That's the time I took one step over towards the line. I and know. Stayed there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's and crazy how back. much better that made you. You know, and I don't mean that. You know, but in the well, eyes I mean, of I did improve. In, I, I improved in other ways. Yeah. I improved in other ways. I did. You know, I made defense a point. And this also came along the time that Gene Glenn came over, who was an excellent infield coach. And he told me, you can win a gold glove. Mm. And I said, Gene, no, I can't. <laughs> and he said, no, you can. And then he kept saying that to me over and over. I'm like, fuck it, maybe I can. And we just, we worked a lot, put a lot of work in. Um, so I'm not saying it was just, I guess I should... It's not just one thing, but that was a big part of it. Uh, my defensive positioning, and then you mix in, you know, my angles were a little bit better. Uh, my my first step was a little bit faster. Uh, you saw, I mean, I went, I jumped. That's a drastic jump, and that'll Huge. get you. That'll get you more playing time. It'll get you more time in the big leagues, and in turn, you know, your career is better. Yeah, third base was definitely your main position in the big leagues, but you did exhibit quite a bit of positional versatility. We're seeing starts here. You've got some shortstop, you know, particularly early in your career. We've got some first base, got some right field, second base, even a little bit of left field. We'll talk about left field actually in a little bit here, but um, you know, what, what's the conversation like when you're, you know, stepping in to play a position, maybe either you haven't played in a while or you haven't played, you know, in the big leagues, what is it like to go in one day and for the team to be like, Hey, we want you in right field today, for example, you know, what, what's the level of preparation there and how is that different from, you know, third base where you, you know, mainly played, let's say. Well, I mean, I came up as a shortstop and I played that pretty much exclusively in the minor leagues, a little bit of third base, second base, but that was it. I was an infielder, but primarily a shortstop. It became pretty evident to the twins that I wasn't going to cut it as a shortstop and that's fine. Like it's, it's the hardest defensive position to play. Sure. Like, bar none like it's the guys that do it and do it well you just you have to look at them in in awe at least i do yeah well everyone's Um, a shortstop at some point you know what i mean exactly you're a shortstop until you can't anymore and i made it to the Mm -hmm. big leagues as a shortstop so i feel i'm very proud of that as well i have some things like some weird things that i'm proud of uh being making it to the big leagues as a shortstop i'm proud of yeah definitely um so it wasn't going to work out they saw that, and I got a call from Terry Ryan, who's a general manager. Uh, I think it was off season before the 2012 season, and he goes, "Look, infield's done. Like, I want you to focus. Let's get you. We want to get your bat in the lineup." As we kept telling me, even though I didn't really have a track record, they, they thought I could hit a little bit. So we're gonna get your bat in the lineup. We got to put you in the outfield. Like, it's, that's the best thing for both parties. And I said, "Okay." So I went played the entire off season as an outfielder or worked the entire off season as an outfielder, entire spring training exclusively worked in the outfield. And I started a few games. I didn't start a ton of games, uh, but I started a few games in the outfield. 
And then at almost out of necessity, uh, third base kind of opened up. Uh, they sent Danny Valencia down and there was like some other injuries. And I was like the, you know, the infielder on the roster, the extra infielder, I guess. And I, that's when I got placed at third base and it just magically coincided with this epic home run run that I went on this power surge that I had. And I basically won. I just snatched the, the starting third base job and I didn't look back for, you know, four or five years. So that's kind of how it went down. Mm -hmm. And then as far as, you know, the other positions too, like, you know, you have like five left field games in there. Like, do you just walk in one day and see that you're penciled in for left field? And you're like, well, time to get to work. When was, when was the left field? I'm looking right now. Left field was 2012. So that was probably early in the season, 2011. It's just, this is when I was like a super scrub and they were just trying to find somewhere where I didn't mess it up. Mm -hmm. um, I remember, yeah. Left field was few 2011, and 2012. Yeah. So <laughs> those are, those are the days where I'm like, not really comfortable out there. And you know, people think, Oh, you can just, you can go play outfield. Like, no dude, people say that about first base too, Bailey. Mm -hmm. First base has so many responsibilities. Like the days where you can just plug some dude over there and think you're going to get away with it. It's they're gone. Like, I guess there's that's, you still try to hide some people over there, but the people that have defensive uh, minded first baseman, that can also have like, bang it a little bit. I mean, they're ahead of the game. Big time. Yeah, I completely agree. I think, you know, some of those guys that like are like fringy defensive outfielders in the league when they try to put them at first base, just cause, and it's, and it's not because like they, like they physically can't play the position. It's just cause they don't have the reps, you know, but it's like yes. jock or Schwarber at first base. Like they're, they're really not very good there and it's not their fault. They just don't have the experience, you know, of, of, you know, coming up through the minors playing it or playing it in the majors all the time, you know, the same way that a natural first baseman does, you know, like a, you can get exposed. There are times, especially absolutely. in the playoffs, you can get exposed, you know, that we other stats out there that say we bunt more in the playoffs. Oh, um, you know, I could look the, into that, but I mean, probably. Yeah. I would because you're, guess. because pitchers are hitting, mm -hmm. um, not anymore. Um, but like that's when you can really get exposed, like bunt assignments, uh, relays, you know, uh, holding guys on, trying to turn it out play. Like that's it's a if you haven't had the reps, like you said, the angles are strange, like the views are strange, your responsibilities are strange. Um, it's it's a tricky position, man. Yeah, and I mean, just in general, I feel like you know, base running aggressiveness and base stealing is way up. You know, in the postseason, it seems like, mm -hmm. you know, your, your responsibility as a first baseman, you know, to do something as simple as like hold the runner and stuff like that. It's just not always a gimme if you don't have the experience, you know, or, or picking, picking a ball out of the dirt can change right. a series. If you Absolutely. fuck up a pick and the guy scores, you know, in a regular first baseman usually scoops it. I mean, that's, a, that's a big deal. It is a big deal. So we're all in agreement. First base is a position. Hundred percent. Yeah, <laughs> it's it, especially nowadays. Yes, All right. with the shifts, like you got to play basically second base as a first baseman. Yeah, totally. Gosh, looking down here. Oh, baby! I know this is this is the big time right here. Uh huh. Let's do uh, let's do June seventeenth, twenty seventeen. Traded by the Oakland Athletics with cash with Kevin Cash. I can't believe you were. <laughs> that's crazy that Kevin Cash was involved in this trade. That that must. You must be really proud of that. Uh, to the Tampa Bay Rays for a player to be named or cash. What's it like to be traded, man? I, it's just so crazy to me. And I, you know, I'm reading right now. I'm reading um, Lords of the Realm, which is a labor history of MLB, and you know, we're, it's a lot of you know, Kurt Flood, Marvin Miller type mm -hmm. stuff. And it's just, it's like, uh, it's just so like if you work an office job that just doesn't happen to you. Like you just, no. it's not like they're like, Hey, we're going to trade you to the branch in Phoenix uh, in exchange for five interns or something like that. <laughs> like, you know, you have just more agency in that way. So, so what's it like to be traded? And I think particularly to a team, you know, as unique as the Tampa Bay race. I mean, those teams working together, are something else right there, Oakland and Tampa. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So I signed as a free agent uh, in Oakland, made it about half a year. And honestly, they didn't give me enough time. I'm, I, I was not doing great, but 
I was a streaky player. I know I knew a hot streak was coming. My numbers would have been fine by the end of the year. I never got that opportunity in Oakland because they had a guy named Matt freaking Chapman ready to come up and replace me. So I actually got designated for assignment before this. It's a little bit different than a regular trade. Um, I got designated for assignment. I'm back in Oakland. I'm uh, essentially packing my life up. And I said, like, I told my wife, I'm like, I'm not going to AAA because you have the chance, uh, you know, with my service time and because I was a free agent, I could have just went home and earned all my money. Uh, and I was like, I'm not going, I'm not going to AAA. I'm not doing it. I'm like, I'm done. I thought my career was over at that point. Um, so two days pass. And then finally, like, I think it was the third day or something like that. Or maybe it was the end of the second day. Uh, Tampa called. And then it was like, shit, we got like, I'm in Oakland. My wife's pregnant. I got, I got to fly out to Tampa. What are you going to do? Like, it's, it's a mess, man. But um, I was happy to like, to know that I was still a big leaguer. Right. And I, I had a really good time in Tampa and like the clubhouse was fun. We didn't end up making the playoffs that year, but we were in the race and uh, yeah, me and Kev, me and K cash, man, just buddies. <laughs> <laughs> what's uh, what's playing in the trop like? Cause I think it's just, it's almost like just this weird, like nebulous place for some people. And I've always wanted to go there, but just, you know, what's it like to, to play in the trop of all places? I liked it. I swear. I, liked I know it, but it seems I was, kind of fun. I was only there for a limited time mm-hmm. and, um, there was something about going to the ballpark and just having the consistency factor that was nice for me. I was like, you have to worry about, do I got to wear sleeves tonight? Do I got to, you know, what's going on? Like every, every game you go in there, you know, exactly, you know, the conditions, all that great stuff. So I, and I liked it. I, if I was there for a long time, I could see how wow would wear on you. Um, it's dull, but for people like that haven't been there, like going to St. Pete is actually a really great time that you go to the, you go to the Dolly museum, Free okay. game, and then there's like a lot of nice little bars um, up and down right by the trop, and you go to the trop. And it's a unique experience. Um, so yeah, I, I had a, a decent experience there. Yeah. Did you ever get to see any shenanigans with like the catwalk during your playing days? Was there? Did you oh, ever yeah. see like a good old you know whatever ground rule double or whatever it is? A, t- a ton of them. It, it happens like way more frequently than you think, I guess. Like it, it, it really does. And then you lose balls in the the tarp and all that stuff. And yeah, there are, we, I want to say we won a game because of the catwalk, you know, just a pop up to the infield, essentially that it hits the catwalk and falls and two run score. It's like, it's <laughs> like talking out loud about it. It's kind of funny. Yeah. It's like, it's like, it's like backyard <laughs> baseball type rules where it's like, you know, Hey, if this, if this, you know, goes behind the car or whatever, it's an automatic home run, you know, if it goes to yeah. the neighbor's yard or something, you know? Yeah. And the bullpens are on the field. Like it's just it's a true. stupid place. Yeah. <laughs> it's, but there's nothing else like it right now. But you know, there's some rays in the outfield. That's cool. You know? Yeah. Did you ever, <laughs> did Actually, you ever they, I feel like they're gone all the time. <laughs> did you ever have an interaction with the, with the rays in the outfield? Oh, uh, I went and saw them. Mm-hmm. But then every once in a while, they they just wouldn't be there. I don't know how they just transported these rays back and forth. And what were they just there for the games? I don't know. Right. The salaries is my favorite part, bro. Okay. Yeah. I didn't see. I wanted to be coy about that, but it oh, is very okay. strange, isn't it? Like, like the people <laughs> watching this, they don't know how much money I make, you know, but every year we know how much money every single player makes at least salary wise you know to the cents bro it's crazy it's <laughs> why can't we have it f- i want it for the owners that's all i want i just want to know Me too. how much the franchise value went up i want to know how great you know their stock market investments did or whatever i just want that they should have their own baseball reference page and then we'll, we'll get a good idea of who's really making oh the money gosh. here that would be something else yeah no they used to put all that stuff in the like the usa today like just boom black and white ink yeah I think we're, I think we're done main page, but there is more if we could uh, delve into okay. it. Sure. Let's go, let's go minor and fall league stats. Oh, okay. I know. Now we're going to get into the nitty gritty. I have a couple questions for you regarding uh, your minor and fall league stats. First of all, you played in fall league in 2007. I did. I did. You know, I, um, on this channel, uh, the most recent video I've done where I sort of like go through scout minor leaguers, looking at their stat lines, uh, it was about fall league. You know, I was sort of, you know, explaining to people, you know, this is a league you get sent to maybe when you're a year out or maybe even two years out for making the big leagues. You know, it's a pretty prestigious thing to be a part of. 
what was your experience like in fall league and just, you know, what, what's it like to be invited, you know? I loved it. It was, it was awesome. Again, like when you get to the chance to just be around like the best of your, your peers, you know, you start to see how you match up. Um, and that's just, it's a concentrated group of, like you said, guys that are kind of fringe big leaguers, like, but, but just young, like not ready, I guess, uh, in the scheme of grand scheme of like seeing enough, uh, pitches in the minor league. So you get down there, everyone's good. I remember, specifically, I remember we, we played against like the USA team at that point. Um, I saw Max Scherzer for the first time there, which was scary even then, and even in 2007. Uh, but I had a good time. We were the Phoenix Desert Dogs. We ended up winning the whole thing. Nice. And I was a shortstop uh, and played well. And I had a manager, and I'm blanking on his name right now, Rafael Ortega, possibly. Well, that's a player. Uh, yeah, he was a former player. Okay, but I mean, there's a Rafael Ortega who plays oh, like now shoot. in the big leagues. Yeah, maybe I'm getting them mixed up. I maybe. I have to look. We could probably find it. But... Oh, you know what? I bet we can. Uh, let's let's go. I won't yeah, tell him if you it. won't tell him. Let's try to find it. No, you don't actually have the manager listed of the 2000. Let's see who you he... don't. Yeah, wow. there's the guys, man. Wow, that name sticks out for sure. Kutch Kutch is a young one, man. Twenty Goodness, years old. He was Twenty yeah. there. I mean, he he must have been. One of the, if not the youngest player in the league at the time. Yep, he was very young, and we had a lot of fun. Kutch and I hung out a lot during the fall league, and really developed a friendship. He's he's the best man. And there's Ryan Sweeney. You shouted out Ryan Sweeney earlier. The guy on this team that everyone was like, "Ooh," was Nolan Rymold. They kept calling him the Judge. Before Aaron Judge, there was another Judge, and it was Nolan Rymold. Mm-hmm. I never really saw it, but the coaches love this guy. Loved him. Oh, wow. Look at this, too. That's a pretty big deal, too. I mean, he had yeah. 16 innings, no runs Filthy. in Arizona. In Arizona? Filthy. It's not easy yeah. to pitch there. Nick Blackburn was like our guy, though. Like this guy. Yeah, um, he had a beast year, too. A beast year. Two walks. Yeah. Yeah, we, 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 we could pitch. Outs, two walks. I remember that we could pitch. And again, we won it all. But this guy, the manager, he wanted to work with me all the time. He wanted to work on my throws across the diamond. So I was out there doing this. Mind you, you play a full season. Now you're going here. So one time I said, hey, dude, like my arm hurts. Like, can we just – I'll go out there with you, but I don't want to throw across the diamond today. Mm-hmm. He starts yelling at me, telling me, like, basically, like, I'm a sissy, and then my arm doesn't hurt, and I just don't want to work hard. I'm like, bro, do you see anybody else out here? I'm the only one out here with you every day. How, <laughs> how could you say that about me? And uh, he pissed me off so much that um, I finished out the day and I was like, you know, my fucking arm hurts. I can't throw the ball across the diamond. And I was like, you know what? I'm done. Yeah. I, well, it's crazy. I didn't, I didn't play. I didn't play the last like two or three games. I was yeah. like, dude, this is my arm is hurting me. And you're telling me I'm like basically a sissy and uh, to get over it. Yeah. And it's full. Oh, yeah. Like you've played it the was whole year. Week. You've played a whole season. This is bonus baseball, you know, oh, whatever. <laughs> Anyways, well, you were champions though. I mean, you were, this is a pretty dominant team. You do it 20 and 11. So the, the, the best part about the fall league is there's a rising stars game. It's the mm-hmm. all-star game of the fall league. I was invited to go to it and they gave $500 cash to each player on the winning team. Wow. Saturday night. They played this game. Sundays in the fall league are off. So you can imagine how Saturdays are. You have Arizona State University there. You know, Scottsdale in itself is a party town. So you give a bunch of young 22, 23-year-olds $500 cash for nothing on a Saturday night when they have nothing to do the next morning. It was a lot of fun. Good times. We had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun. Good times in the Arizona fall league. It really is. And you were 21. Unreal. <laughs> the guy made me, I forget his name now, but he so he's so mad at me. I don't know. He I had you whipped in the shape, though. I mean, that the team dominated, so you can't question his methods. Oh man. All right. Okay. Other thing I want to ask about on here is this absolutely hundred mm. uh, percent. as a Lehigh Valley iron pig, uh, in 2018, uh, in your age 32 season, you pitched. You did pitch, you faced six batters. You got two of them out. 
Uh, I think I finished the ending off. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You did. I think it says, um, okay. I swear I checked here and it said you finished the game or something like that, but yeah, yeah game finished right there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there it is. So you did finish the game. You are, you're basically closer, you know, um, obviously the story is it's a blowout, but, uh, you know, what's it like to make your pitching debut? Who, who decides of the position players to pitch? Who decides that it's going to be you, Trevor Plouffe? Well, a newly appointed first base coach, I believe, of the Detroit Tigers, Gary Jones, was my mm-hmm. manager. And we had a great relationship. And look, I'm 32 years old at the end of my career in AAA. I'm basically all, I'm like a player coach at this time. Um, I'd made it to the big leagues, back to the big leagues with the Phillies that year. And then I got designated for Aaron Loop at the trade deadline. So this is at the end of the year, and op- my attention span is not really good i know this is the i I wanted to finish the year out because that's the kind of guy i am but um man this was like i just had a lot of fun playing i guess like i wasn't really taking it too seriously Uh, i was dh'ing a lot and in this particular game you know it was getting out of hand i I just told i was like gary i got let's go man yeah so you did you got me in there what were you throwing? Are you, you know, are you kind of, cause here, I'll tell you what, a pet peeve of mine is when they do the position player pitching and it's, they're just throwing batting practice. I, hate and I get that they don't want to throw out their arm, but like, I think you should go out and try to give us a little something, something. So what were you throwing? I'll try to get you some video. I might have some video somewhere. Yeah. I bet this. it's on MILB TV somewhere. Uh, I was I was trying to get people out, no doubt. I think I was featuring like eighty four to eighty five with the heater. Sure, I was throwing a, a slow banger up there. I got a, I got a lot of guys like down early in the count. I couldn't put them away. Mm. That was my problem. So yeah, a couple O two hits, stuff like that. I I, and I like I said, I was giving it my all. I wasn't. No offense, like Brett Phillips and stuff. I know people find that entertaining, but. I'm I'm out there competing, bro, because I I've waited a long time to be on that mound. Sure. Did you pitch in high school? I did. I was really good in high school. I was a two way player. Um, definitely could have got drafted as a pitcher. Mm. Uh, maybe not where I got drafted as an infielder, but um, I take a lot of pride in it, man. I'm actually pitching in my alumni game, which takes place in a few days. Ooh, that's fun. And I just, just dice all these kids up, man. Where Where's your alumni game? Crispy Carmel. Oh, I see. I see. Crispy caramel. <laughs> uh, let's uh, let's switch gears. You ever you ever get into the splits? I of like course. the splits. Yeah. This is still, you know, we're still scratching the surface here. But I have a couple splits I want to talk about here. This this one is one of my favorites. Uh, as a left fielder, Trevor Ploof, mm. uh, you slash 313, 389, 688 for a 1,076 OPS. This is basically the same as what Barry Bonds had as a left fielder. So I guess the question is, you know, are you the greatest left fielder of all time? When you, sh- when you shrink it down to 19 plate appearances? Yeah. Probably not. I bet there's someone with much better numbers. Yeah, unfortunately, there probably is, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, we talked about this. Left field was what, 2011, 2012? I wasn't mm-hmm. a very good hitter. I did have some pop in 2012. So I'm surprised with the 313, 389. Just, I mean... I might have faced some, maybe some lefties that day, or bad guys that didn't throw hard, because that was ended up being my kryptonite was the high velo. Yeah, I actually kind of saw that when I was scrolling through here. There's a split for uh, power versus finesse pitchers or something like that. Oh yeah, give me the finesse guys all day long. Yeah, I'll see if I can come across that, but. <laughs> The other thing I was looking at here. Oh, there right it here, is. Oh, my. Yeah. Finesse, you were 762 OPS. Yeah. Power, 675. OBP the same, though. That's interesting. Interesting. That is the very slugging is up, though. Yeah. And I think it's, it's worth keeping in mind, like, you know, we talked about sort of like, you know, 2012, 2013, 2014, 20, like these are your years, basically. Like this was like. This was kind of like the third dead ball era in MLB in a way like you had, you know, you know, you had like early 1900s before Babe Ruth and you had, you know, late 60s, early 70s. But like before, you know, the juice ball stuff, you know, offense was really down in the league. A lot of these years you were playing. So, you know, you might look at like a 762 OPS and think "Eh, that's average. That's average, you know, 
today, but back then, I mean, it was pretty damn good, you know? I agree. Again, I go back and forth with my career all the time. Now you're pumping me up. I feel great about yeah. it. Um, I will say that those years as well, the, the pitching that I was facing was really good. Yeah. The AL we Central had some that. really good pitchers. Um, you know, if you look at like the people I faced most in my career, it's like Chris Sale, Justin Verlander. You know, then I had to go through the whole gauntlet, the, the Detroit rotation. Scary. So I'm proud, you know. I did my best. Definitely. But it, it, it is worth bearing in mind that it's as weird as it is to say 2014 was very different offensively speaking versus like, you know, 2022. A hundred percent. Another, another um, pretty cool split here is we have the uh, opponent splits here. And um, you know, these are small sample sizes here, but against Baltimore, you liked facing Baltimore Trev and, and, you know, again, the years you're facing Baltimore, like these were good Orioles teams, you know, yeah. like this, 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 this was a team that was in playoff contention more often than not. So, you know, um, was it something maybe you were aware of when you played like, Hey, I have a pretty good track record against this team or, or were you thinking more, maybe, you know, pitcher by pitcher, you know, sometimes, you know, what was it like to, you know, just have maybe like a team or pitcher that you felt like you did well against? I'm curious to, if other guys will say the same thing, but I felt sometimes organizationally there was um, similarities between pitchers and sometimes mm. it just matched up against organizations. Uh, the Orioles, we played a lot coming up to the minor league. So maybe I knew some of those guys, the Yankees, we played a lot coming up to the minor league. So maybe I knew some of those guys felt more comfortable. Um, definitely played them in spring training. So like, you know, the more and more you see people, the easier it gets as a hitter. We know that. Sure. So it is a good feeling. And, you know, going into Baltimore, everyone wants to hit in Baltimore. Now they're moving the seats back. We'll see how it plays out there. I don't think it's going to do – I don't think it's going to change much. It's just a good place to hit. Um, but looking at this now, I, I I did know that my interleague stats are pretty good. And my National League stats, like I think I, I think I should have been a National League player. Yeah, maybe you were a National League guy all along. I think look, I'm I mean, an NL guy. All these yeah. teams, these are all National League teams up here. Well, look at the interleague right there. Yeah, I know. That's crazy. 819 OPS is not something to sneeze at. No. I mean, especially because like we, we already established that you were the king of the third dead ball era. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that is pretty Unfortunately impressive. for me, I was uh, an AL basically my whole career. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you know, at least you were a pretty good pitcher for the Lehigh Valley Iron Picks. So I That's right. All Who's right. My worst team? Who's my worst team with a bunch of at bats? With, with a bunch of... Um, Let's go. Let's say Royals, Oakland. Oakland. I mean, it's 150. Tigers, yeah, yeah, but it's it's not it's not a great slash line. I got. Well, they have good it. pitching. They did. And, you know, you were. Know. It, that's that's Bay Area. You know, that, that's not quite it for you. You know, you're more you're an LA guy. Well, I wish I was facing them when I had Dallas Braden. I would freaking just absolutely rake. My numbers would be excellent. <laughs> Slop he throws up there. Please don't please don't try to start podcaster beef on my second channel trevor save it for the first channel okay okay all right we're here with batter versus pitcher stats which i was just talking about some of the tough pitching he faced in the uh, al central especially and um you know we could see kluber up there one of the pitchers he faced the most verlander um you know if you go down here a little bit you know we got scherzer you know we got we got a bevy of names jason here. vargas yeah, wore faced, me out like that, man. I mean, he he was probably just getting ground ball after ground ball off you, don't you think? I mean, four strikeouts and thirty-seven plate appearances, so you're putting the ball in play. If I had to guess, you're like, hey, what were your career numbers against Jason Vargas? I would have said like really good, soft toss and lefty. Yeah, it's true. That's man. kind of your archetype, right? Well, can you know, tip the cap to that. Yeah, uh, sale. We um we yeah, had let's go sale. So we had something on him. Mm. The problem was I couldn't see it. And I'm really good at that. Like I would pick up pitchers and stuff like that. And I still do. And I can do it pretty easily. Yeah. You do it but on your show sale, sequence. That's right. Thank you for the plug. Sale had something going on. And a lot of our guys saw it. Uh, Dozier specifically loved facing him. He like saw this thing. I don't want to give it away because I might, I might sell it to the highest bidder. I don't know. Sure. Sure. 
Um, those are really solid. So there was one year where we just crushed him. And Tyler Flowers kept saying, what do you guys got on him? What do you guys got on him? And I go, hey, bro, can you ever think that we're just good hitters? And he's like, no. And I was like, well, you're right. But <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes that happens, man. Yeah, all my sale, all my sales stuff is legit. I didn't have, I, I couldn't figure it out against him. But you had teammates that could. Yes. Let's, uh, you know, Justin Verlander. I mean, I in some ways, Trevor, I owe my career as a baseball YouTuber, Justin Verlander. Uh, that's the first video I made that really gained any traction and kind of sent me down this path. Um, it, he, he kind of owns you. Um, yeah. but I mean, he kind of owns everyone. So I feel like actually this, these numbers probably aren't too different from like the average hitter against Justin Verlander. Um, but yeah, so, you know, you, you mentioned that, you know, power pitchers could be difficult for you. You, you know, you preferred facing lefties. So considering this guy was basically tailor-made to be a difficult matchup for you and mm-hmm. matchup for anyone, you know, just what's it like to face Justin Verlander just to stand in the box against that guy. He was tough for me. It was hard to have a game plan against him because he attacked like all parts of the zone and he had, you know, primarily he's a power pitcher, but he had some great off-speed pitches as well. Like, and he could really, um, like, I don't know what his, his fastball was topping around a hundred and his slowest breaking ball was probably like 80 something. So, you're, you know, maybe even slower than that. So you're talking, that's a big uh, difference in miles per hour. So you always was able to like mess with your timing. And again, like I said, change, he changed eye levels you know, probably better than anybody. And he was at the forefront of that, like riding fastball at the top of the zone, which exactly. like I said, the, it has been my kryptonite, spin. but he's, um, yeah. When I think about facing him, it was that it was difficult to have a game plan against him. Mm-hmm. And whenever I did like get a hit, I was really happy. I will say this. I remember getting starts against him when I was kind of a scrub because we were, we were saving the other right-handed hitters, the embarrassment, you know, like sometimes you take care of the guys and you put like scrubs like me in and then you're like, fuck, like, well, this is my only a bet for the week. I better, (laughs) I better do something. Here's Justin Verlander. So that was difficult. Um, but overall he's, I mean, he's going to go down as one of the best pitchers ever. Yeah. Do you off the top of your head, do you know what pitcher you hit the most home runs against? I do, I think. I think it's Liriano. I think you're right. Um, yeah, and I did a, I did some big damage. And this is like my buddy, buddy. Like, I, I know. love Frankie. Well, he's, and he's a front page of baseball reference guy, and you're not, sadly. So He just was. That's yeah. really funny that I was him. Great. One of my favorite, my most favorite teammates I ever played with. And then when, when he went off, um, I didn't think I'd have, like, he wasn't a guy I think I'd have success against, even though he is a, kind of like a softer throwing left there, at least at the time that I faced him, he wasn't bringing the velo, but he still was like deceptive, had a really good change up. Um, the slider wasn't really there against me, I guess for righties, um, at that point, but there's just something I barreled his balls. I did like a- any count, any time, like I was putting the barrel on it and sometimes you just have those guys. Yeah, I mean five five extra base hits and ten plate appearances. Yeah, it's pretty pretty crazy. All right, I got one more little baseball reference feature to show off here. We're gonna do a streak finder. Okay. For Trevor Plouffe. I'll load it up. You're taking like me on a whole new ride of baseball yeah. reference. I'm a surface level baseball reference person, I guess. Mm-hmm. I do this all day, man. All right, so okay. we're we're just gonna do. We're looking for games where you had a heat for you had a, a hit. And so this is basically just a search for your longest hitting streaks in your career. Ooh. So let's just uh let's get some results going. Longest hitting streak. Did you had a pretty good one? Uh you had a 17 gamer uh in 2012. Oh, okay. June yeah. 30th to July 19th. Do you have do you have memories of you know coming? Hey, I've got a you know. Coming into the to work one day, hey, I've got a 14 game hit streak, 15 game, six. You know, was that was that on your mind? This wasn't just a hit streak. This is like a homer streak. Like I was, I was like, I was. This is 2012, right? Yeah, right. And I'll I'll point this out too, Trev. You know, just a couple weeks earlier, we have a seven game hit streak where you hit seven homers. So this is around the same time, kind of a continuation of that. 
June, June and into July, I actually got hurt. I got jammed by a Lou coach of her fastball and blew a nerve up in my thumb, mm-hmm. which honestly altered the trajectory of my career. Cause I was going off. Nobody yeah. could get me out. I was so locked in. Like there was no doubt in my mind. I was going to hit over 30 home runs. I ended up with 24. Um, I was, I like had found it. And then coach of her blew my thumb up. I had to take like almost two months off and it was, it's tough to think about still, but this time, yeah, I was, I was just locked in. You go back and look at tapes. Like there wasn't a ball that my barrel wasn't on like their foul balls. Um, pitches. I even like, I missed a little bit. My barrel was just right there. I was just one of those times where you're just super locked in. And that really, I mean, that gave me a career that two month stretch like that put me on the map and they're like, wow, like there's something we can dream upon this guy again. Uh, Cause a lot of times like that's what keeps you in the, in the big leagues is like, Hey, this guy can get better. Or we can, we think he can do this. And that streak right there, that basically gave me a shot at having a career. And then I had a couple of good years in 14 and 15, and, but that, that streak right there, man, I definitely remember that. Yeah. The streak that gave you a career, you would say. I, it really is. Mm-hmm. And now you're people in Minnesota still remember that. Yeah. Now I'm a podcaster. Yeah. People in Minnesota still remember that, which is crazy. You know, we weren't very good that year. So I think it was one of like the, the shining moments and it was Josh Willingham and I going back and forth with these home runs. It was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you for joining me, Trev coach Trev. Um, Thank you you for joining me on, on referencing baseball, which is totally an established name brand show that I have on this channel. (laughs) Not something I'm just doing as a one-off. Um, is that a Braze thoughts? blanket back there? I want that, to see your blankie. That's, that's exactly what it is. Go Braves. How about the Braves? I know you're well for not only the Braves, but now, now the Rams, you know, you've, you've got a streak going. I'm on when I'm, I'm, I'm on fire right now. My, my world series prediction, I have one in my head already. We're going to go over all the mm. teams and stuff. I'm going to say right now, the Braves are not my prediction. Well, prediction. sure. It's tough to repeat. Tough to repeat, and I factor that in definitely. Mm-hmm. But I think you like the teams I'm thinking of. Okay. Yeah. But two, we have how many free agents still out there? We have no know, idea what I these know. teams are going to look like. I'm definitely struggling with that aspect of it because I want to get going into the preseason. Let's rank some players. Let's rank some teams, blah, blah. It's just you can't, you know. I mean, the, the full picture isn't really set for the season with all these free agents out there. Yeah. 